Hello and welcome to today's lesson on the interpretations questions within the Nazi Germany paper. So I want to start off by thinking about what is an interpretation? An interpretation is a historian's view of the past. Now historians have different interpretations of the past. Even when they look at the same thing, they might not necessarily agree on it. Today we're going to think about how we identify a historian's interpretation, why historians have different interpretations. Now the interpretation questions on your paper will be broken down to 3b, 3c and 3d. You'll be required to read two historians interpretations. You need to understand them and compare them. Question 3b asks you to spot the difference between the two interpretations. Question 3c asks you to explain why historians have different interpretations about the same thing. And 3d asks you which interpretation do you agree with the most? So which of the two historians do you agree with? Now today we're going to take a look at some Stresemann interpretations to to get you used to this and give you a nice example. So I'd like you to start off by first of all thinking back to our work on Stresemann. Make a list of six things that Stresemann did to improve Germany. If you can, divide these into domestic improvements, improvements he did within Germany, and improvements for Germany's international position. Hopefully now you've remembered perhaps the most important one that Stressman did. He ended hyperinflation by the introduction of the Rentenmark. So this new German currency, which helped solve the hyperinflation crisis. You might have also remembered the Dawes and Young plans, which helped Germany economically by managing the reparations that had to be paid and helping Germany get loans from America. You might also have thought about the Locarno Pact, the kellogg brion Pact as well, and the fact that now Germany has joined the League of Nations. Hopefully you've managed to remember those six things. So, let's start off by looking at our interpretations. First interpretation here is from the historian C.N. Truman. His interpretation goes like this. As foreign minister, Stressman achieved a great deal. His greatest achievement was to get Germany accepted back into the European community. His philosophy of abiding by the Versailles Treaty won him allies in Western Europe, and it was France that sponsored Germany's entry into the League of Nations in 1926. He was responsible for the Locarno Treaties. In 1926, Stressmund and Briand were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for the work done in work done by both in rebuilding relations between both countries just eight years after the end of World War I. Such a situation would have been unthinkable four years earlier in the aftermath of hyperinflation caused by the French Belgium inv invasion of the Ruhr. Second interpretation is from Keith Shepherd. He says Thanks to Stresemann, the economy began to recover. In 1928, industrial production finally surpassed pre-war levels. By 1930, Germany was one of the world's leading exporters of manufactured goods. However, the German economy still had serious weaknesses. It depended on American loans, which could be withdrawn at any time. Unemployment remained a serious problem. The economy might be growing, but it wasn't creating jobs fast enough. Employers complained about the money the government spent on welfare, benefits and the unemployed. Finally, some areas of the economy, such as farming, continued to struggle throughout the 1920s. Stressmen had solved the problems for some, but there were still extremes of poverty and wealth. Right, we've got two interpretations there. What 
how do they differ? So what is it they don't seem to agree on? Is there anything that they're both saying that they do seem to agree on? If you can, write a sentence summary, no more than that, of their opinion of Stressman. Now the first question we'll get is 3b. Study these interpretations. They give different views about the success of Stressman. What's the main difference between those views? So we go back to our two interpretations. We're looking for what do they say about the success of Stressman? Clearly, Truman thinks he's wonderful, extremely successful, because he says things like he achieved a great deal. He then gives, gives a list of achievements, including um, the joining the League of Nations, the Kellogg Briand, the Locarno Treaties. He's obviously stressing all the things that went well for Stressman. So he's saying Stressman is a great success. If we look at the second interpretation, it's not quite so sunny. He's certainly more sceptical about how successful Stressman was. He does say Stressman had some successes. For example, he says the economy began to recover. But he says it still had serious weaknesses. And he points those out. The fact they're dependent on American loans, that they weren't creating jobs fast enough, um, problems with unemployment, uh, welfare benefit, farming. So he's saying, yeah, there was some success, but that success was limited. So Truman's just totally successful. Stressman was fantastic. Shepard is saying limited success, some successes, but also quite a lot of failure. So how do you actually write that up? Now, this is a four mark question. So actually, you really don't need to write very much. It's quite a nice one. It's just to spot the difference. So you'll always follow this formula. Firstly, state the difference. The difference is, then quote from both interpretations to show how you know that. So here we'd say the difference is interpretation one suggests Stressman was extremely successful. Interpretation two suggests he was somewhat successful, of limited success. This is shown because interpretation one says, and then choose a nice quote that says how wonderful Stressman was. But interpretation two says, pick something about limited success. Top hint, leave a line between each section to highlight where you identify the difference and then where you include supporting evidence from each source. Give it a go then, see if you can do it. Right, now that we've worked out the difference between these two historians' interpretations of Strassman, we have to ask, why is it historians think differently about the same bit of history about the same man. So, why is it historians think differently about the same bit of the past? Well, it could be that the historians have looked at different evidence, different sources. For example, one might have looked at propaganda, whilst another looked at diaries. Different sources will lead you to different interpretations. Also, the historians might have focused upon different aspects. So you get cultural historians who are going to be looking at film and literature, and they what they look at is very different to an economic historian who's going to be interested in statistics on GDP and unemployment and money and banks and all of that. So, for example, in Nazi Germany, you might have a historian who really focuses on terror and is looking at the SS and the Gestapo and stuff. 
Rich Matt have another one. He is very focused on propaganda, so looks a lot at cinema and film and things. It sounds like a hard question. It honestly is not. I cannot stress enough. Learn this by heart, put it in, and you will pick up the four marks, okay? You're either going to say, the historians have given weight to different evidence, which is a very fancy, nice way of saying they've looked at different sources. Then you can give an example of some different sources they might have looked at. Uh, or you could say, the historians have focused upon different aspects. I think that's slightly harder because you'll have to be able to pinpoint that one's like a political historian, whilst one's more like economic or social. So if I were you, and I was stumped by this question, just write the historians have given weight to different evidence, and you'll almost certainly pick up two marks of the full. Okay? It does not need to be a long answer. Um, you can bring in sources if you'd like to. You can see page 150 in the textbook for a model answer. Here's my model answer. This is for a different question, because I didn't want to want to give you exactly the answer. But this is how easy it is. Okay. Why have they thought differently? They thought differently because the historians have given weight to different evidence. Truman is likely to have looked at sources such as personal diaries or memoirs. However, Flanagan is likely to have used SS Gestapo records or diaries. Okay, you can see there that I've linked in to source B and C. You can do that because you will have some sources as well that you use in question 3a. If you can see that there are, they are good example sources, then you can use them. But you don't need to use them. It might confuse you a little bit. So for the moment, I'd probably recommend just ignore the sources bit <clears throat> and just give an example of the kind of source you think that historian might have looked at. Wants to use diaries, memoirs, records, film, cinema, propaganda, any piece of evidence you could think of that would tell a historian about the past. I'm going to go back here so that you can see which of the two phrases you're going to use. If we look at Stressorman here. I would probably, for this one, use the idea that they focused on different aspects. Because Truman is saying a lot about the League of Nations, Kellogg, Briand, Locarno. All of that's foreign policy, isn't it? So he is focused on foreign policy. And that's led him to say, what a successful man he was. Shepard, on the other hand, has looked at domestic economy. And that's led him to say, it's not so successful. Because he doesn't talk about the foreign policy at all. He just talks on economics. He's talking about wages, jobs, that sort of thing. So Truman's successful because he focuses on foreign policy, while Shepard says he's not successful because he focuses on the economy. That's why they differ. Uh, so, I would use number two this time. Have a go writing your own answer to question 3C. The final interpretations question um, is the long interpretation question. And it says, how far do you agree with this interpretation about the success of Stressman's policies in between 24 and 28? So, interpretation two, we already know 
that interpretation too, said that Stressman was only somewhat successful. It was kind of emphasising his economic failure, wasn't it? So how far do you agree that Stressman wasn't that successful? That's what it's saying. Now you're going to use both interpretations, so you need to quote from them, and you need to bring in your own knowledge. That's why we did that quick recap at the start. Now, to help you with this, I've got some structure sh strips. I'd like you to glue these down the left-hand side of your page in the margin so that you can then use them, tick off as you go, but it shows you the exact structuring you use. Now, this interpretation question, normally in an exam, you'd spend 20 minutes on. Today, you can spend as long as you like, because it's your first time doing it. Um, before you begin, the first thing to do is put your ideas into two columns, for and against interpretation two. So, have a look at the next slide. Before beginning an interpretations question, always make sure you do this for against planning grid. So we're trying to find evidence for the idea that Stressman was not successful and evidence against that. Now, it's important we put our two interpretations in because we're going to have to use them. So interpretation two suggests he wasn't that successful. We're going to find a nice quote to go with that. You've actually already done that. Why else could we say he wasn't that successful? Well, we could say the economy didn't really fully recover. It was totally based on American loans. So if those loans suddenly stopped for any reason, like they're going to do in 1929, then the German economy will also crash. We could point to his two great economic plans, the Young Plan and the Doors Plan, and say, well, actually, they didn't really have time to be implemented. And they reduced reparations rather than stopping them. Okay. So point to the economy to say it's not that successful. On the other side, you need some evidence that Stressman was in fact an extremely great um, success. Now you've got interpretation one, focusing on his foreign policy. So you could bring in the Locarno, the Kellogg Brian, the League of Nations, all of that are successes. You could also bring in the Renton mark, because his greatest success, surely, is stopping the hyperinflation crisis of 1923. That is fundamental to the recovery of Germany in the 1920s. So I'm definitely bringing the Renton mark as evidence that he was successful. Now, this is a set of ideas. I'd put a little star beside whatever evidence I decide I know enough about to write about. Because I don't necessarily need to bring it all in. So I'm definitely going to bring in the Renton mark because I can make that good argument that he was very successful for stopping hyperinflation. And I'm going to bring in the Dawes plan because um, it's a good one to say, well, actually, the reparations were managed rather than um, stopped. And so Germany's economic recovery wasn't that great. Now, you need to use that information, the two interpretations, to decide, do you think Stressman was successful? It's all about reaching your own conclusion. I, myself, I think I'd probably argue it was pretty successful. Make sure you check your SPAG for this. SPAG stands for Spelling, Punctuation and Grammar. This is the only time in your Germany paper that you will get extra marks if you spell and punctuate right. So this is the time to go back and check those. 
Right, I'm going to leave it up to you now. You've got your 16 mark question to have a go writing. Do you think Stresserman was a success or not?